Welcome to the Michigan Man Podcast on Wolverine Sports Radio, a member of the V-Sporto Network and in partnership with SB Nation's Maze and Brew for Wolverine fans from coast to coast. Go Blue and welcome back to the show. I'm your host, Mike Fitzpatrick. Week two of camp is almost in the books and Sharon Moore is happy with what he sees. Joining us on our game day segment this week, will be Clayton Safey from the Wolverine on three. Coach Sharon Moore met with media on Tuesday and seemed relaxed and upbeat about his team. He was asked if any players had stood out to him in camp so far. A guy that really has been where he was in the spring and taking the next step in fall camp is TJ Guy. He's a guy that's really taken that next step of, you got Josiah, you got Derek, and you got him, and you got other guys that are chomping at the bit, but he's really taken that that step to be an elite player and, and be that guy that, you know, there's not there's not that much of a drop off like last year. So I feel really good about TJ and he's he's changed his body. He's done a lot of great things and all I mean, at every position you can go down the line and we'll talk about other other positions, but another guy that just jumps out is a guy that has started games for us is Gio El Hadi. I mean, he's changed his body and the things and then I think being behind Keegan and Zinner the past couple of years, he's really done a really good job of of learning, you know, we always say watch, emulate, surpass, and that's what he's trying to do. So those guys have all, you know, the whole the whole team's been outstanding, but those two I could think specifically, and ironically, they're really, really close. They're, I think they were roommates, so good to see. There are high expectations that once again the offensive line will be very good. Sharon said he's happy with how they are coming together so far. They're coming together great, and you can ask the defensive guys. They've given them a run for their money. You know, I know that as long as I'm here, we're going to be good up front. We're going to be violent. We're going to be physical. We're going to be tough, relentless, all the things you want. We have a couple guys that are cementing themselves at ones, but, we, you know, not a whole first group yet. I think we got a lot of battles still going, and it's kind of like last year. We, I mean, we had guys who were starting. Miles Hidden started the first four or five games and then didn't start after that, but still played. So I think the competition is just going to continue to go into the season as we keep going and uh, excited for to see how who rolls out week one. Sharon didn't give much away when asked about the quarterback competition. I mean, they're all been really good. They've had their days that one guy's been good, one guy's been really good, one guy's been better. So not a front runner, really kind of all even playing right now. And we'll see how we go into this week, next week, and then game week. He touched on the decision to bring back Jim as honorary captain and why it won't work out for the opener. I just actually just talked to Coach uh, yesterday. And, and really what went in the decision is we made that decision like in March or I think it was January, February, actually. It was really to honor him of what he's done for Michigan. I mean, came back for nine years and, and took us to where we are now. So it was really to honor him. It was nothing besides that. And, uh, you know, yesterday he called me, told me that uh didn't feel that he could leave his team in true Coach Harbaugh fashion and wanted to be in the foxhole with his team and not want to make it look like he was taking a, a deep, long bow. So uh, he's not going to make it for the game. But... We're going to have uh, some of our guys that are there, and then Jack and Jackie Harbaugh are going to take his place. So super excited about that. Sharon said after two weeks of practice, he likes where his team is and is proud of their work ethic. He said they just have to keep working every day to get better. My guest today says he thinks Michigan will be a contender in the Big Ten race and be in contention for the 12-team playoffs, but it won't be easy. Up next is Clayton Safey, from the Wolverine on three. So stay with us. Back with us this week uh, on our game day segment is Clayton Safey from the Wolverine on three. Clayton, always great to have you with us. So welcome back. Great to be here. I'm excited and uh, football is near. So very pumped for that as well. Yeah, it's uh, two weeks uh, into fall camp now, almost two weeks. And we keep hearing the competition is heated as you'd expect. Tuesday, Sharon Moore met with the media and said, in his words, camp has been phenomenal. And uh, my takeaway from watching him was how relaxed he was and really pumped up, wasn't he? He was definitely fired up. I think I I wrote that in one of my articles as well, that he, you know, was very fired up about what he's seen on the field. Obviously, he had to answer some questions about, you know, some of the different NCAA news that has come out lately. But more than anything, he wanted to talk about the players, the the guys standing out, the way fall camp is gone, how they've played very physically, how you know there's no complacency, things like that. So 
I agree. Um, and, you know, he's getting better and better, it seems like, every time he meets with the media. Not that that stuff matters all that much, but I feel like it's just another step of him settling into the job, which is nice to see heading into the first season under Sharon Moore and a new era, even though it feels pretty similar to the last one. Of course, everyone wants to know about the quarterback battle, uh, whoever they're talking to on the staff. And I didn't read anything between the lines in Sharon's comments. He said it was a, a day-to-day battle and there's no timeline to name a starter. He said, said it could be the week of the game. It could be game day. So it's hard to get a good read on how that competition is going, isn't it? It really is. And I think that's intentional, right, by Sharon Moore. And obviously, uh, you know, a little bit of gamesmanship there. And you do have a really tough schedule going into, you know, early on in this season. Obviously, Texas week two, but Fresno State week one isn't a complete pushover either. So I think it's very intentional what Sharon Moore was doing. Now, maybe it is true, right, that three guys are still in the mix, Alex Orgy, Davis Warren and Jack Tuttle, and maybe there is no separation, right? He said one one day somebody plays great, the other guy plays really good, and then the other guy plays good, and then the next day it's kind of that same thing, but maybe in a different order. Somebody else is the one playing great, the other guys are behind him. So you want to see separation, you want to see somebody pull away, and you know perhaps that is happening. So like you, I didn't have a huge takeaway on that other than the fact that it, it does not seem like they're going to name a starter until game week, as you said, game day potentially. And, you know, the time most recently that that has happened, I believe, was Denard Robinson uh, in his sophomore year in 2010 when he took over for Tate Forcier. I think that was the last time Michigan went into a game day without uh, naming a starter. And uh, it can be exciting. You know, that was, uh, that was a big win over, over UConn that day. Of course, the season didn't pan out the way Michigan wanted it to, but I think that they're going to, you know, keep it close to the vest. And I also think that really anything's possible for the opener. Could we see all three of these guys out there knowing, um, and of course, you have to have a big lead as well to uh, to experiment, but knowing that Texas in week two uh, wants to hone in on one guy and game plan, and probably even right now Texas wants to game plan and hone in on uh, one guy, if it's Alex Orgy or Jack Tuttle or Davis Warren. So, Uh, Some gamesmanship there, I think, knowing that the Longhorns are waiting in week two. Well, we heard the offense really took it to the defense in the first padded scrimmage over the weekend. And again, yesterday, uh, Sharon had high praise for his offensive line, said they're really coming together. And again, I don't know if uh, what you can read between the lines on that, but he uh, feels very good about his offensive line. Yeah, and he said, as long as I'm here, you know, we're going to have really good offensive lines. And that's paraphrasing, but it was it was pretty much exactly what he said. And, and you have to feel good about that part of things, right? I mean, he did such a good job really taking this offensive line to the next level over the last three years. I thought they were improving and very good under Ed Warner. And in 2018, when he took over, you could really tell a difference that they had really leveled up. And a lot of those guys, of course, in 18 and 19, then were very experienced, had a lot of snaps under their belt. So that helped as well. But the move by Jim Harbaugh to promote Sharon Moore to offensive line coach before 2021 was one of the more pivotal uh, things that, you know, decisions Jim Harbaugh made. And obviously it leads us to this day where Sharon Moore is is heading into an opener as Michigan's head coach. So huge for the program and and potentially going forward. I think this offensive line, you know, there's a lot of confidence in that building, it seems like, in this group. Um, I've been encouraged by what these guys have talked about, you know, Gio L. Hadi and Josh Preeve and, uh, you know, just talking about how this group has come together. I am a little hesitant, though, um, you know, just because even last year when they had so much production coming back, they struggled a little bit early mm-hmm. on to find their groove. So it could take a little bit of time. But I do feel like they have the parts here and they're adding some more depth to where at some point this year, this is going to be a very good line. And as Sharon said, you have to trust him, right, that he knows what he's talking about when it comes to the whole line play. Well, I think it's uh, interesting this time of the year at these pressers uh, when a coach goes out of his way to sort of uh, mention or pump up guys. And I thought yesterday or Tuesday when he mentioned Gio El Hadi on offense, TJ Guy uh, on defense on the edge. We know Gio's waited a long time for this, but he's played a lot of snaps. He's experienced. We expect him to be good. And TJ Guy stepping up, that would be huge, wouldn't it, Clayton? It would be because, you know, I, I really like what this, starting deep defensive line is going to be. I mean, I think it could be the best in the country, but the one question has been the depth. And, and Sharon Moore has continuously mentioned TJ Guy as somebody who has stood out throughout his career. And I would liken, you know, his potential of 
you know, breakout status this year, similar to Mike Morris a couple of years ago, where I know he rotated in a little bit, and Mike Morris, he moved around the defensive line here and there in, in 2021, which is the first time we really saw him in somewhat of a significant role. But then in 22, you know, he goes out there and really became uh, one of the anchors of that D-line, gets drafted, of course, unfortunately missed last year with an injury with the Seahawks, but is healthy now, playing under Mike McDonald. And if TJ, you know, that was his senior year, right? His fourth season at Michigan. So I think TJ guy could be in a similar mold. Um, you know, it seems like depth is building on the interior of the line. And then, you know, at edge as well, I think you do have some competition with Cam Brandt, who's a sophomore. And then Dominic Nichols is another guy that Sharon Moore just keeps mentioning as well, that he really likes a freshman who early enrolled in the spring, had a big spring game. And, uh, you know, it seems to, you know, be really turning heads behind the scenes. Well, Sharon, uh, as you said, mentioned some of the freshmen who were standing out, Jaden Davis, Shannon Goodwin, uh, the tight ends, Hanson and Priscorn, uh, Jordan Marshall, mm-hmm. which we've been hearing a lot about. He said he had a chance to be dynamic and special. Uh, you just mentioned Dominic Nichols, who everyone is saying has had a great camp. And then linebacker Cole Sullivan, you hear a lot of good things about him too. You wonder each year which freshman could see early playing time have an impact and it sounds like, at least right now, those are the guys to watch early, right, Clayton? I think so. Um, you know, and, and as Sharon Moore said, it's easier to play the further away you are from the ball. So wide receiver, and maybe defensive back. Um, but, you know, there are some guys in the mix that play relatively close to the ball, right? Jordan Marshall will have the ball in his hand, uh, you know, when he gets in there. And I think he it really is going to be somebody who makes an impact at some point, you know, whether we see him in, in garbage time early in the year and, and breaks off some runs. And the next thing you know, you know, the next game maybe gets a couple more carries and uh, could be, you know, similar to Kalel Mullings last year where I know Kalel Mullings was a veteran, but he was still somewhat new to the running back position. And early on in the year before he had a hand injury, they got him some carries late and they were like, okay, we might, might have something here that, that may uh, warrant some snaps early on in games. And, started to see that when he was healthy. So I think, you know, the running back depth will kind of work itself out early on in the season, but Jordan Marshall certainly in the mix and Cole Sullivan. I mean, I, I, I enjoyed so much watching him in the spring game where it's one of those guys that just stands out on every play and that you have to watch. And you almost feel guilty not watching the rest of the play sometimes because you're so focused in, but he's that fun of a player, I think. And, and Dom Nichols as well. You know, so, I mean, three of the guys there that Sharon mentioned, but I feel like when you look at positions and, you know, who's in front of them and things like that, those are the three probably most likely to play. But he did mention Channing Goodwin, whether that's special teams or offense, uh, the wideout spot is going to contribute in some shape or form, uh, as you noted there. So that one's interesting to me because that was the first we'd really heard of him standing out. So maybe we'll see him and some others as well. And I think Jaden Davis, that quarterback, probably a year or two away, but obviously encouraging to hear some some positive news there with him. Well, Sharon had a lot of good things to say about his receiving core, just as Coach Bellamy did the week before, especially uh, the strides made by Tyler Morris. And I know a lot of our fans are, you know, sort of in wait-and-see mode when it comes to those guys. But it sounds like as a group, Sharon likes what he sees, doesn't he? I think so, you know, and, and I think that they do have talent at, wide receiver and if you know Tyler Morris is really going to be the guy if he can take on that big role and be just steady and trustworthy I mean think of how trustworthy last year Roman Wilson was from game one on where J.J. McCarthy knew you know whether it was on platform or off script that he could find number one Uh, it's going to have to be the same thing with whoever the quarterback is you know do they have that go-to guy outside of your tight end and Colson Loveland who we can't discount the impact that he's going to have, but I think it's really important to have somebody at the wide receiver spot that can do that. And, and Tyler Morris is certainly the guy they're pointing to. Uh, Samaj Morgan, you know, they're saying he's looking to become more of a complete receiver and is really bought into the blocking aspect of things. No block, no rock, as Ron Bellamy says. And uh, Samaj Morgan, you know, is kind of a Ron Bellamy guy, right? Played for him in high school, so he certainly is bought in there. And then Frederick Moore, I think. It's potentially an X factor. If he can give you enough uh, production as kind of a third wide receiver, then I think you do have a pretty good core here. And we have to remember, too, that Tyler Morris had 13 catches last year. And it seems low and it seems weird to say, okay, a guy with 13 catches is now going to be your go-to guy. 
but this has happened at Michigan. You know, they don't throw the ball as much as some other teams. They don't play as many receivers as much as some other teams. So if you don't have the opportunity, like Roman Wilson did a few years ago, uh, then you may not expect a ton from them the next year, but then they break out, right? Roman Wilson ended up getting 60, 70 targets or something like that. So there's opportunity to make a big jump in this offense, and Tyler Morris is the guy I would circle as somebody you know that certainly can do that. Well, another position battle we're watching is who will start at the corner opposite Will Johnson. Uh, from what Sharon said on Tuesday, and maybe it was more the way he said it, uh, Jair Hill has been outstanding in camp so it sounds like he might be the other starter at corner doesn't it Clayton it does and I wouldn't be surprised if maybe there's some sort of rotation there early on in the season kind of like there was last year when you know Josh Wallace came in but then he sees that job pretty quickly and I think that's kind of what you want to see there and getting guys reps early on in the year isn't a bad thing either because somebody can go down like Will Johnson Mm -hmm. in the Ohio State game and you're going to need others to step up. Now, luckily, they had Mikey Sanders still who could slide over uh, as well and, and be, you know, really solid there. But I think building that depth is important. I mean, we saw a number of injuries in the defensive backfield for Michigan last season. They had to play some different safeties. You know, Macari Page was not 100% during the national championship game. Keon Sab comes in and has a big impact. Quentin Johnson came in in the Rose Bowl, had a big impact with a forced fumble. So, uh, depth will be important, but it did sound like Jair Hill is still leading the way there. Amir Hall, the Albany transfer, pushing him along with some other guys as he gets up to speed. So if Amir Hall can be similar to what Josh Wallace did last year in terms of picking things up really quickly despite coming in in the summer and then kind of acclimating to the speed of the game at this level. Uh, and, of course, Amir Hall jumping up even an extra level, having come from the SBS. But if he can do that, then I think – you got probably three really serviceable corners. Of course, it's weird to call Will Johnson that. We know he's yeah. much more than that, but three guys that you can really trust and, and put in there. Well, another uh, positive I thought or took away from uh, the presser on Tuesday was Sharon mentioned that Rayshon Benny is uh, back practicing like nothing ever happened, and he broke his leg in the Rose Bowl, if uh, folks remember. So that is really great news and adds some much-needed depth, doesn't it? For sure. And, you know, you look at, the defensive tackle rotation and you see three guys who, you know, and Rayshon Benny would start most places, but you have perhaps two of the best, and if not the two best defensive tackles in the country, Kenneth Grant, Mason Graham, Rayshon Benny comes in. They played five D tackles last year, uh, 240 or more snaps. And all three of those guys were in that mix. So you're kind of looking for those next two. And, uh, you know, Lou Esposito said this week on the, in, in the trenches podcast that, Eno Etta, who moved over from edge to defensive tackle in the spring, is now up to 308 pounds, has really impressed there. Trey Pierce, who's his classmate as a sophomore, more of a nose tackle. Uh, and then Ika Luna, a guy who's a, a redshirt junior who has never played a snap during games at Michigan. Uh, all three of those guys are in the mix. So if you can get, you know, find the next Cam Good, find the guy who was the Rayshon Benny last year, then I think you really have a good mix there. You don't want to take Kenneth Grant and Mason Graham off the field all that much, but you got to keep them fresh as well. So that's important. And I know it was one of the big keys for the staff coming into fall camp, and it sounds like they've, they've found some some options there here through a couple of weeks. Yeah, and, and you know, a lot of us uh, going into the season or in the off season talked about, well, we're not going to have the depth that we've had the last couple of years uh, on that deal line, but – I thought it was interesting what Coach Esposito said, well, you've got a lot of uh, young men who you've just not heard of yet that are unknown, but they're going to be right. re- really good football players. So I felt good about that too. Definitely. And that's kind of what you know Michigan D-lines do. I mean, you know uh, our good friend John Borton, who I work with at the Wolverine, of course, a recurring guest of this show. And you know, I remember at Big Ten Media Day in 2022, he asked Mozzie Smith a question about, hey, how are you going to replace all these guys, Aiden Hutchinson and you know, David Ajabo and, and others up front. And Mozzie said, man, we've been doubted every single year. And every single year, Michigan has a great defensive line. And sure enough, they were even better at the other positions, you know, outside of Hutchinson and Ojabo, but better on the interior, uh, you know, than they were the year before. Last year, they were even better than they were in 2022. And, you know, this year, they, they might have more talent, at least on the interior, than they did last year, uh, at least with the starting group. So it's just, kind of what Michigan does, it feels like. And uh, Louis Vizito has been really impressive in the early going, the way he's recruited, the way 
Uh, he's motivated these guys the way the players have talked about him. So I think it could be another – it's got to be the strength of this team, I think. And, um, you know, it, it has to be really to, to you know, unlock the potential of this defense because it all starts up front. Well, Sharon also touched on the place-kicking competition, which a lot of us, uh, you know, were concerned about. But he, he said to transfer Dominic Zavedas Vada. I'm not sure how you uh, actually pronounce his name yet but that he's talked about how really good he's been. And J.B. Brown, I think last week mentioned, was it six or six or seven from beyond yep. 50 yards and very good inside the 50. But Sharon mentioned that Adam Samaha was having some really good practices. So from everything we're hearing, and again, especially from what J.B. Brown said last week, Zavada is another big-time leg, isn't he? I think so. Um, you know, and that it was really stood out. Uh, you know, something that stood out to me when he committed was this guy's made a 56-yard field goal in a game in college football. He's made a 53-yarder, I think two 53-yarders. I, I guess it would just be one, but he, he's two of three from 50-plus in his career. Um, you know, he is uh, 12 of 14 from 40 to 49 yards. So really good, really consistent from the long distances. It's good to hear that when he's in a new setting now, playing at Michigan, a little more pressure to be good you know, and will be facing his former team in week three, uh, yeah. that he has acclimated well. And I love to hear, like, a, an actual stat or a fact yeah. of what goes on in fall camp. It's a little different than, hey, this guy's look good or this guy's look good. And, oh, the D-lines, you know, uh, you know, they're playing fast or whatever. But to actually know a stat, hey, this guy made six or seven for 50-plus in actual uh, game-type situations during practice was really good. I would expect him to win the job. I think that was the plan all along. And, uh, you know, it sounds like so far so good. Yeah. Well, another thing we learned from Sharon's presser is that Jim will not serve as honorary captain for the opener. I think his mom and his dad will be there. They'll represent him. And I wondered if Jim would take, you know, the time away from the Chargers this time of the year to be there. So, I mean, it's understandable why he can't. But, man, would that have been fun to see him walk out the tunnel or what? It would have been amazing, um, you know, and really surreal to think, it would kind of take you back to the whole the whole nine year journey of you know him coming back and leaving the NFL and then you know this slow build and climb that you know these different la- uh, rungs on the ladder that Michigan had to reach and get over the hump against these rivals and you know, beat Ohio State and then win a college football playoff game and then to win it all for the first time since 1997 I think he would have gotten as big of a standing ovation as long of a standing ovation as there has been really in any situation like that in Michigan stadium history. Um, so obviously it would have been very cool. I, I do think things got blown out of proportion a little bit with, you know, uh, Ward Manuel saying on a podcast that Jim was going to come for the opener uh, that got aggregated right after he got his four year show cause from the NCAA. People yeah. took it as, Oh, Michigan sticking the middle finger up to the NCAA and bringing Harbaugh back. It's not true. That was scheduled back in the winter. He was planning on it all this time. And I think if you watch, as I did, a little bit of the Chargers preseason game over the weekend on Saturday where they didn't get a first down until their seventh drive, I think Jim realized, hey, I, I can't, you know, one week before we open the season against the Raiders, I can't leave this team, uh, especially, you know, with how much work they have to do. And obviously they're pretty banged up right now with Justin Herbert out. Um, so that, that didn't surprise me. He said he didn't want to, you know, make it seem like he's taking a deep, long bow one week before starting his NFL journey back up with the Chargers. I certainly respect it. Um, I certainly understand it. And as you said, it's kind of Harbaugh fashion. You know, I'm sure he'll come back for some game at, at some point, maybe not this year, and, uh, you know, hopefully re- receive that same type of standing ovation. No, I'm sure he will. And, again, very understandable why he can't make it for the opener. So, uh, yeah, it'll be fun when he does come back in the future. Well, Sharon briefly touched on, you know, this NCAA stuff at the presser. And uh, as you and I talked about before we started taping, it just, uh, it's, it's sort of nice this week so far. We haven't had a lot of it. But he said he looks forward to the texts being released. And, man, we heard about those last week. Again, mentioned there has been full cooperation with the NCAA. He sounded very relaxed when talking about that issue, though, didn't he, Clayton? Definitely. And uh, I think that, He's very confident in, in what would come out if those texts were released. Obviously, uh, we have heard some rumblings going back to last week that that is a possibility. Um, of course, I don't know the exact rules on, you know, confidentiality or, in, you know, of the investigation. I know people at Michigan probably weren't happy that, that you know, things got leaked uh, a week or two ago. But uh, if those do get released, you know, I think Sharon Moore is pretty confident in the, the outcome there. 
And, you know, look, he, the uh, ESPN report with the draft of the notice of allegations didn't include uh, a serious charge, a level one charge for Sharon Moore based on the text messages. It was only that he had deleted them probably out of a panic, you know, once media reports came out that Connor Stallion was at the center of this investigation. So it tells me that they're not serious. Again, that just reaffirms it with what Sharon Moore said on Tuesday. And I think if they do get released, people will be able to move forward. And really the focus is on the 2024 team. I mean, things aren't going to play out in the short term here with the NCAA. They have things resolved from the uh, now it's bacon cheeseburger gate. Uh, <laughs> and then obviously the, the sign stealing stuff, that'll, that, I mean, that's going to drag on. Think of, you know, for the minor recruiting violations, it took four years to resolve. So yeah. I'm thinking it's going to be quite a while here for this next investigation. And, you know, things, things are going to cool down, as you said here, I think, in the next couple of weeks, and we can just focus on football. You no, know, they're sort of going to cool down. I, I want to focus on football, too, but we've got sure. the Connors Stallions uh, Netflix <laughs> documentary coming up. Uh, in, I think it's on August the 27th, the week of the opener. And I wonder, do you think we will really learn anything new other than uh, Connor's take on the whole situation? Well, I, I do stand somewhat corrected that it will come back up on August 27th. So great, <laughs> great point. Great point. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I think a couple things. One, in, in any of these situations, no one on their side really wants to dig too much into the full context. And I think this is a little different because I think Michigan fans have been pretty pretty involved here. But, you know, when it was Kansas and the FBI wiretaps, if you didn't like Kansas, um, you know, and, and if you, you know, are a fan of following rules, you know, for the, for the most part, I think you were – you know, you, you painted Bill Self a certain way. Obviously, then he ends up getting his lifetime contract or whatever. But uh, same thing with North Carolina when they had the academic uh, issues there where, you know, the state classes and things like that. Everyone painted them a certain way. So if you're an Ohio State fan in this case, I don't think you're going to change your mind. If you're a Michigan fan in this case, I think you're only going to uh, have more confidence in your own stance. But it's not to say that there won't be some interesting information in there. I think Connor Stallions is probably going to talk about um, you know, some of the things that we heard throughout the fall last year that, hey, every big time school has a sign stealer. If you're not trying to steal signs, you know, you're, you're not really, you're not giving yourself the best possible advantage. It doesn't mean you have to break the rules. And, you know, if Michigan did that, obviously uh, they will be punished for it. But I think that there's just going to be added context to the story and to this kind of, you know, worst kept secret, maybe in the college football world that stealing signs. You know, it's, it's pretty common. And there's a reason why you have signs, right? Is that, and this goes back to playing Pop Warner football, you always have different signs so that the opponent doesn't know what you're running. It's a part of the game. So I think to that extent, we will learn some more about what exactly goes on there, what exactly Connor Stallion did, and how the NCAA responded, whether it was too much or too little. Um, you know, I would say it's probably the former, but it's going to be interesting. I'm going to it's going to be tough to resist staying up until midnight or whenever it releases on that night to, uh, to watch it because it, it should be pretty interesting, and I'm sure it'll dominate the conversation for you know, a few days or something oh, like that. Oh, man, yeah, it will. And I, and I have to give Netflix <laughs> uh, credit. I think the NCAA and their folks could take uh, an example or a lesson uh, from Netflix. Uh, they have not leaked a peep about what's uh, coming out in that documentary, have they? Right. No. Um, I would imagine there were probably some non-disclosures there, um, but I, I do know – who a few people of the that are being interviewed in it are going to be. And uh, I, I do think there will be some late shed on, on what exactly goes on here, what other teams are doing as well, which could be the fascinating part of this. And uh, yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be interesting to see. Well, Clayton, before camp started, I know uh, most of us, probably all of us were really jacked up and excited uh, about this team 145 and the national media seem to think Michigan is still a formidable team as we do. But I wasn't sure what the tone uh, from the staff and the players would be during camp. From the coaching staff to the players that uh, you're seeing at media availabilities, they are giving off very confident vibes, aren't they? I, I think so. And, you know, Sharon Moore has, has kind of done that. You know, when, when uh, even he was asked the other day about, you know, how much talent you lost, 13 guys in the NFL, he he kind of quickly said, well, we got a lot of talent here. You know, we got four or five guys that are could go in the first round of the draft next year, you know, and I think they're very quick to, to point out what is coming back despite, you know, the Rod Moore injury, 13 guys to the draft, a couple more that were undrafted free agents and seven of your 10 assistant coaches along with Jim Harbaugh. It's a lot to lose, but 
at least in the short term here, Michigan has a lot back and they seem confident about it. I think a lot of the confidence comes from knowing you have a potentially elite defense again. And then an offense that really is a little bit more experienced than people would think. And Kurt Campbell, Michigan's offensive coordinator, has mentioned that a couple times where he's like, he said, you know, we only have one guy who was technically a returning starter last year in tight end Colston Loveland, but we have you know, several guys who have started in the past. And I, you know, counted it up and it's 10 players uh, with 109 combined starts on, just on offense uh, in college football. Josh Preeb is a starter at Northwestern. Giovanni Elhadi started a few games a couple years ago on the offensive line at Michigan. Miles Hinton was a starter. At Stanford, Tyler Morris has started games. Max Bredesen, uh, you could go on and on. So, um, you know, Samaj Morgan as well, I believe. So, you know, there is some confidence there. I, I will say that a question mark is still the quarterback spot, the consistency of the offense, especially early on in the season. Um, but if they win that Texas game, Mike, and they're 2-0 and and you, know, you have Arkansas State and then you have confidence going in, to, you know, some of those other big games, USC, Washington, and then the rest of the way. Uh, but you also, you know, have a really good win on your resume that people are going to look at. You could drop two, three games potentially at the end of the year, still get in the playoff. And, um, you know, I think that's why there are so many possibilities for this team, just because uh, there's a chance to build a really good resume. And there's still a lot of talent here that wants to prove themselves as well. They're hungry. You know, the guys who didn't start last year are, are as hungry as anybody to get their own national championship, get their own Big Ten championship as a main player and starter on this team. Well, final question uh, before we let you get away, Clayton. Uh, this month I'm asking every one of my guests to cover Michigan the same question since we're in speculation mode, or as I told you at the top of the show, I call it speculation month. This is it. It's sort of a two questions, but would you be surprised if this team, 145, is in contention for the Big Ten championship and a playoff spot? Or are the expectations maybe too high right now? I wouldn't be surprised. Um, you know, and I, I would expect them, in fact, to be in that mix. Well, I wouldn't be shocked if there may be a tier below that um, in, in kind of maybe regress to 18, 19, you know, Michigan type of teams. But I'm not predicting it at this point. I think they're going to be right in the mix. And, you know, Ohio State is very good. Uh, you know, I think that it's going to be tough to also play Texas in the non-conference, but, you know, obviously it won't count against your Big Ten record. And I know Oregon is receiving a ton of hype uh, this year, but I'm I'm not sure what they're going to be by November with all that travel, having to adjust to a new conference. I'd pick Michigan to win that game on November 2nd, and that could go a long way in determining what the, the race in the Big Ten looks like heading into Columbus on November 30th. And, Mike, you you and I know when they go down there, uh, guys like Donovan Edwards, guys like Ray Sean Benny, who have made plays down there, and those are just two off the top of my off the top of my head. There are others, right? Uh, Macari oh, yeah. Page, who has an interception in that building, and many others are going to play with absolutely no fear against the Buckeyes. And even on the Ohio State side, they may have a little bit of that mental hurdle they have to get over, like Michigan had for what you know the better part of two decades, or that Ohio State had in the 1990s when quote-unquote, worst Michigan teams were able to beat Ohio State because that's what, you, that's what they did, right? right. Uh, so this is, a, this is a rivalry of, of you know, that's very cyclical. Michigan has the upper hand right now. So I, I'm not predicting Michigan to win the Big Ten, but I'm predicting that they have a chance, and I'm predicting that they will be right in the mix. Well, it is going to be one heck of a long and exciting season. And for my listeners who are not subscribers to the Wolverine, Wolverine on 3, I keep telling them you should be. Because uh, every day you've got your podcasts, uh, you've got just great content. So for our listeners out there who are not subscribers yet, I don't know if you have any deals going on right now, but tell us about uh, what is available. Yes, uh, the Wolverine.com is the place to go, and they can use the promo code UM1 uh, for two months of premium access for just one dollar. So you can get in on the message board. You can uh, read all of our. Premium articles are you know, insider intel from guys like Chris Ballas and EJ Holland for just one dollar for two months. So if you if you sign up right now, you know I'm thinking, what well, you get the beginning of the season, you get really about halfway through the year, and then uh, yeah, who knows? Maybe they'll want to stick around as well. Um, so, but I, I appreciate that, Mike, for uh, having me on and for uh, you know promoting the Wolverine as well. You're a great uh, 
a known friend and trusted agent. Well, uh, I've been with Wolverine uh, as a subscriber uh, and the Wolverine on three for a long time. Again, to all of my listeners, you don't know what you're missing. So uh, check it out and look at the uh, the code, the promo code in the uh, the show notes too, Clayton. So thanks again awesome. for taking so much time uh, from your very busy schedule right now to join us. Our guest has been Clayton Safey from the Wolverine on three. And uh, we will get you back very soon. I think the next time we talk, we'll be uh, dissecting one of the games, which uh, we can't wait for. So, again, thanks for the time, and we look forward to that next visit. Can't wait. Thanks so much for having me. On Quick Hits today, once again, no injury news to report after two weeks of practice. The only injury news this week concerned J.J. McCarthy, who underwent surgery on Wednesday for a torn meniscus. The Vikings said he will be out for the season. A tough break for J.J. after a really nice start the other night in the first preseason game of the year, so we hope he has a quick recovery. A reminder to tell your Wolverine family and friends about the show, and join us again next week as we continue to preview the upcoming season and give you the latest news out of fall camp. That does it for now. Have a great Wolverine week, everyone. I'm your host, Mike Fitzpatrick. Until we meet again, take care, and as always, go blue. Thanks for joining us today on The Michigan Man, here on Wolverine Sports Radio, a member of the V Sporto Network, and in partnership with SB Nation's Maze and Brew. Our listener lines are open 24-7 for your calls at 313-263-4842. That's 313-263-4842. Or email us at themichiganmanpodcast at yahoo.com. That's themichiganmanpodcast at yahoo.com. The Michigan Man Podcast is produced at the studios of Robin Lynn Productions, Allen Park, Michigan, and is not affiliated with the University of Michigan. Go Blue!